Hey, what's going on everyone? My name is MG The Future. Thank you guys for joining me on my channel today. And thank you for participating in another legendary chat. Today's video I will be having with Miss Hazel. Um, she's from the UK, but she's currently in Singapore. And she's a CEO and founder of a company by the name of Musio. Depending on how long you've been following me, in fact, it's probably how you found me. I did a discussion about a year or two ago talking about the fat lady sings in, in Z minor. And I think that's hilarious when we think about Z minor. But anyway, what that discussion back then was about was about AI leading in plugins and DAWs and technology. Well, Hazel, <laughs> she's leading up an AI company that plans on implementing an AI that's capable of listening to music and capable of sorting and filtering through the audio file. And there's a lot of potential in that that brings a lot of positivity. And there's also part of it that's kind of creepy, kind of Star Trek, kind of Star Wars, kind of simulation theory-esque about it. A few reveals in terms of what does that mean for humanity? What does that mean for creatives? What does that mean for us music producers? So let me know what you think in the comments. And again, I appreciate your time and support. I'm live. Alrighty. Hello everybody. Okay. This is MG The Future. I'm Today I'm here with a special guest. Her name is Hazel from Musio. Is that M-U-S-I-I-O? That's correct, and you said it perfectly. Awesome. So tell us what you're about. I, I met you a couple of months ago. I heard you were shaking things up with the AI side of things, and I would love for my audience to know more about how you started, what's going on, and hopefully we can dive into the AI part of that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I guess what I'm about is I'm pretty much all about music technology. Um, I've, I've worked in music my whole life. You know, my very first job out of, uh, out of school was at a record store. Um, you know, back in the day when people used to buy lots of CDs, yes. and uh, you know, I've I then was very lucky to get an early start in a in a company that at the time no one had heard of called Shazam, and uh, and I and I kind of worked my way up through the tech industry through various different other startups, um, and more recently, just last year, decided to start my own music tech company. Uh, so we're working on artificial intelligence uh, for specific tools for the music industry. So um, I, I would love to like give a more detailed description of what I'm about, but you know, maybe you know, or for anyone who, who's listening who knows, uh, starting your own company uh, becomes all you're about. I yes. literally don't do anything else. So, uh, <laughs> so I, you know, I started work at 9 a.m. this morning and, and I'm, I'm still going, still going 14 hours later. Oh, wow. So, so, you, so where I'm from, we would call you a hustler and an entrepreneur as well. <laughs> yeah, and you know that word. That word. I, I like the word hustler. I'm okay with that. I find I find the word entrepreneur interesting because I I don't really consider myself an entrepreneur. Like I guess I am because I started a company, but I didn't start it because I felt compelled to just start a company. You know, I started it because I love the music industry. And I saw that there was a there was a need, and I thought that this was something I could do. Um, but you know, I, I don't I don't think there's probably many other types of company I would probably be that passionate about starting. Oh wow! And you mentioned Shazam. I don't know if I've ever knew that or if I missed it, but I'm familiar with the app. And that, is that the app that's able to listen to something playing and identify it in the database of what's playing? Yeah, absolutely. So I I worked there um, over ten years ago now. So I was one of the very sort of early stage employees. I worked there before the iPhone came out. Um, I worked there when it was a UK only company. Uh, so it was it was quite a quite a different business back then. But yeah, that's um, that was kind of my first you know real job after after, after college. That is amazing. So you kind of been nudged into. Uh, this type of recognition and AI type systems anyway. So when, when did you get the idea to go from Shazam, that experience, loving music, being in the store, to going, I'm very passionate about this, I'm gonna make it a real thing. Like, what what took you from any other pursuit to this one? How long ago did that take place? Um, I, I, I probably left it longer than a lot of um, entrepreneurs do or, or a lot of a lot of founders and I think because like I met my co-founder through a through a startup incubator and I think the average age at the incubator I joined is like 28 
Um, but I'm 35, so I left it a good a good few years longer than most people. But I feel like I just needed that amount of time to get to a place where I felt confident that I could do it. Um, because I also don't really come from a background or from a place where people just start companies. You know, yeah. starting a company now is as fashionable as becoming a DJ or, or you know, learning guitar. Now it's like, oh yeah, I've got a company. Um, but that, it certainly wasn't something from my background or something that I saw, I'd seen lots of people do. So for me, it, it took a little while longer to get there, you know, and it really, you know, one thing that the incubator did for me was it really puts you in a place where you go, okay, yeah, you can do this and do it right now. You know, it kind of just puts you in that, in that mindset. Oh, wow. So tell us, what is, what is your company? What did you end up incubating? Uh, so we we started. I met my co-founder January last year, so Jan 2018, and uh, we essentially we're focused on artificial intelligence, but how those products can benefit the music industry. So it's a, a, a short version of it is it's an AI that can listen to music, and by that I mean you know we we've figured a, a way to be able to teach an AI to replicate a lot of the listening behaviors that you see in a, in a person. So if there's something audible that you can detect in the music, whether it's a male or female vocal, whether it's a, a certain tone, whether it's a genre, whether it's a specific instrument, if, if the human ear can identify it, we can usually train an AI to identify it with, with a high level of accuracy. So the reason we started this company is, um, you know, back when I was a lot younger, when I started in the industry, you know, I, I got my first guitar when I was 13 and it was, I think it was 500 pounds, which is about a thousand dollars ish. Yeah. Um, and that's really expensive. And, you know, I, when you're starting out in music, you're then relying on, uh, you know, as everyone else got instruments, can we afford rehearsal room? They got a minimum, a minimum booking time. You know, if we want to get in the studio, do we, if we got a couple of thousand bucks, we can, we can head in and make this happen. And the barrier to entry was just always very high. I remember from, from a young age and even then, how do you, how do you get your music out there? And what we've really seen change in the last 10 years with, you know, the internet, with smartphones is that, you know, now you have platforms like SoundCloud where anyone can get their music up there, you know, Spotify take direct uploads now, but also, you know, you got GarageBand free on, yes. free on, you know, devices, you got, you know, uh, DAWs direct on mobile phone, you got, you got Fruity Loops, you got all different kinds of applications. So if people want to make music now, they can do it pretty much with their smartphone and and nothing else you know and an, an internet connection to upload it so previously like 10 years ago there was maybe you know I, I was just telling someone earlier today I used to when I worked in the record store I used to put the new release CDs out on a Sunday ready for the Monday morning and there was probably be like maybe between three and five per week wow. so it was a very it, the, and this is UK but there wasn't that many songs coming out maybe the week before Christmas there'd be 20 because everyone's going for the Christmas number one but you know every week sometimes two sometimes three never more than five and that was really the the volume of new music now there are 30,000 new songs every day uploaded to Spotify wow. SoundCloud have 72 hours of music uploaded every minute so what we've seen is now everyone can upload their music to the internet which is I think a good thing but what it what it's meant is there's just so much content now. There's so much stuff out there that it's it can be harder than ever to get discovered. So we wanted to build a tool that would ultimately help more artists get discovered, help more music get playlisted, and also help people have it help help users have a better experience to find what they're looking for in the, in the the vast world of music that that now exists. Wow, that's a tall order. <laughs> That's a very well, tall you know, order. Don't you know? Don't don't do something little. You know, go right, pitch it right up there. That's what I say. So if I hear it and understand or process this correctly, then what you're building is basically like this ultimate A and R who has time to sort, listen, and categorize music. And then mm -hmm. once your AI is good enough at that, I guess my first question is, or it's kind of funny question is, how do you know if he's a good A and R? <laughs> That is a good point, actually. Um, 
And A&R is one of the things that the AI is capable of doing. Um, but actually, we found some of, the, some of the biggest excitement for our product has actually been within the streaming industry. Um, and I say that because, you know, these days, if someone goes to use a streaming service, they really expect a personalized experience. They expect to be able to get new playlists regularly refreshed with content that they're interested in. Um, and so the use of the AI to be able to playlist has been our, has been our biggest draw in the, in the last few months. But the, the A&R side is, is a little bit more of a moonshot, but it's also where it gets exciting, you know. And I think our, our thoughts around that are really just that you should attempt to train the AI to replicate an individual A and R person as closely as possible. So you you build up. You would almost like you like you would on any social media platform. You build up a profile that becomes the things you like, the sounds you like. It it, it creates a feedback loop that that hopefully learns over time. So this is similar. Well, what you're describing reminds me of when Apple Music first came out. When you opened the app, you pretty much pick your genre, you mm. know, your favorite things and some of the bands and artists you're familiar with. But you're saying that this particular AI would be able to do that with new music on the fly. Yeah. So that's it. So when you say when you open open an app and it asks you to pick a genre, like you know, you might you might pick. I don't know, hip hop or R and B or something, but sometimes those genres are so generic. You know, is it what are we are we talking a more Nicki Minaj hip hop track or are we talking some old school Dre? Like what are we talking here? Very different. So but if if you can use audio as a reference, then you can pull up much, much more accurately what you're looking for. So it's not just doing like a tagging thing. So it's not going Hey, this sounds like it's from the '90s here. Hey, this sounds like this will be with you know, like Universal artist Nicki or or uh, Cardi B mm. here. This is actually yeah. going into the the music, music, not the labels or metadata. Yeah, it uses the audio file itself, not the metadata tags, and that's because if you you know the kind of the existing methodology is currently the metadata tags, but you're usually then having relied on someone to tag it. So manually go through and assign the genre or the characteristics or the or the era, but then also you're just pulling out everything then that's got like a '90s hip hop tag on it, which may or may not go together. Um, right. But if you use the audio file itself, you can get a pretty a pretty good match and a and a nice a nice combination of those of those characteristics. So yeah, aud audio file first. That's what we're going with. With with that kind of thing and me listening to so much music or talking about so much music, how do you guys deal with filtering stuff that's none of that? Like, let's say there's a, an experimental artist or very amateur artist. Is there a mm. quality assurance built into the filter as well? Um, so there are a couple of there are a couple of options there. I mean, we did actually build a filter that can identify the production quality. Um, which, which at this point, you could probably choose to ignore or not ignore, depending on how you felt. You know, maybe you're you're looking for the diamond in the rough. So actually, let me search through the talent in the low production quality, because anything high quality is probably going to be already you know signed and, and taken. Or maybe if you're putting together a a playlist for you know your your DJ and or you're playing out, you're going to just want the really high quality stuff. So. There can be multiple reasons why you might want to search in either category, but if you've got that category, that's that's how you're able to, to sort and search it much better. Wow, because that, that's the main thing that interests me about this process of getting a machine or an algorithm or anything to try to curate our experience, because I know many times I'll fall in love with tracks that will never get released or will mm. never be mixed and mastered. They're just yeah. demos, they're just roughs. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes I use those as a catalyst in search or crave other music like that, that maybe is. So the mm -hmm. fact that you guys can consider that or adjust to that, that's gonna be amazing, I think. And yeah, and there's another thing as well, you know, cause I've, I've sort of been asked this a few times before and it's about the idea that w with within AI, you can get like clustering. 
So, you know, people say, how do you had the, the issue with technology? And I would argue with people as well is when one thing becomes popular, it often becomes popular and everyone starts trying to replicate it and everything starts sounding a bit the same. But really what you need to look for with AI is when you're pulling out tracks that have certain characteristics, you're also then looking for the songs that lie just outside of that bracket. So they're, they're, they're in that direction, but they're a little bit further or they're a little bit more to the left or to the right. Because what you're looking for is where does the trend go next? And, you know, if you have enough data and you're able to see a cluster and a trend of where the trend is going, you know, it's not that hard to then say, and the next step is likely to be. And wow. that kind of puts you a little bit ahead of the game as well. So there's a, there's a few different ways to, to look at the data when you when you have masses of data. What you just what you just described to me, and I didn't expect to go this direction. In my, in my mm. mind, I have this thing in my discussions, especially when I talk with one of my uh, podcast hosts, um, Craftmaster. I have this thing called yeah. words connect, and uh -huh. what that means is that there's enough things happening, enough comments that I've read, enough stories and pictures where my brain will nudge me into a direction of something that's about to happen. Mm. So, so I call yeah. it words connect. I'm also familiar with another guy. Who used to work with uh, um, Microsoft in the early days? He's out there in Seattle and Portland area in the United States West Coast, and he has something called predictive linguistics. And oh, okay. So he takes all the words and he sorts, and then he can uh, get glimpses of possible headlines that right. will happen in the news because there's so much language. And his theory yep. is that humans leak uh, direction. Uh, and, yeah. and me, as a person who experienced it as a human with my limiting processing power, I know this to be true and I demonstrate it all the time in my videos. But what you just did is said, with <laughs> AI, you can take the same kind of process and go, I can predict a trend in music. That is mind boggling. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, and that's just, you know, kind of how computer theory and how predictive analysis works but another great example when it comes to music is you know I was talking with a, a customer in the Indian market Indian music market now they got very different genres over there you know you can't take the genres that work in the West and just transplant them straight into India there's very, a very different scene you know there's very different sort of sounds traditional folk classical Bollywood lots of different Indian music but what some of the labels over there are trying to do is how do we just start to introduce the new sounds to the market? OK, because, you know, at the minute they might see something that's popular in the US or the UK that might hit 10 years later in India. Right. But how do we close that gap? Can we make it from 10 years to five years? And if that's possible, then can we imagine all music on a on a scale from naught to naught to 100? And if rather than serve them you know they're listening at, at at 100 rather than serve them a naught go all the way all the way there why don't we serve them a 98 then the next week we serve them a 96 can you walk people along the journey towards the music that you want so you can start doing global releases so you can start <laughs> moving music along that's what that's the kind of thing people are looking at that that is that is like a nudge so so basically you can yeah. they can have a dilemma a dilemma is we want or I'll, I'll use a loose term. So India wants to become a global, be able to enter the global market with their local talent or artists and who mm -hmm. their stars are. They want to mm -hmm. bridge the gap between what they do versus what the Western world does, I'm assuming. And yeah. in order for that to take place, the actual inbuilt in billions of people in India have to be, dare I say, conditioned to, to themselves I mean, like yeah. and, and have that kind you of know, music. And, and, and so if so if 100 is is say traditional Indian folk music and zero is a, you know Cardi B song like what what's 98 is it like a, a, a predominantly traditional Indian song that's just one of the same instruments or with a beat that's heading in the direction of the Cardi B song you know and then and then, you know, halfway through, is it a voice that sounds more like Cardi B? Like, you know, how do you wow. how do you open up markets to new artists? How do you take them on? <laughs> how do you take them on the journey with you? You know, that is that is amazing and it's scary. But I I like the idea that it I, I like the idea that the computer theory makes it possible. So mm. so here's a weird question. So when you guys look at this data and you start getting confirmation that these type of things are possible, does mm. that then affect your 
your your local operating system in your mind about things, about people, about music itself, about the nature of media, art, and then the way that humans work? That's a that's a really good question. I've not been asked that one before. Um, I I I don't think it has changed my opinion. I think what it does is for me, it's just broadened my horizons about what's possible. And, you know, the way the way that, you know, content can be presented in different ways. I think it's, if anything, my mind's just expanded to the to the possibilities. I don't I don't think anything has you know, particularly caught me off guard. You know, it's okay. it's a bit like that, that those early moments when I was working at Shazam, the very first time you try it, you hold up the phone and it gets it right. And you go, whoa, that's magic. How do they do that? Um, and there are often those moments where you, you can't believe it can do what it does. But I, you know, I'm, I think I'm in this industry and I do this because I'm a believer in those moments. You know, and, and I, that's what I'm that's what I'm here for. So I don't let them catch me off guard. I'm here to I'm here to find them. So I'm looking for them. Oh, wow. So you're already predisposed to a different how, how do I say a different mental framework. So it, it doesn't well, change your framework. Yeah. Your framework is influencing the outcome. Yeah, well, I mean, we actually interestingly getting on to we can get on to like how you potentially influence AI, but I'm. I, I like to think that I keep a mind that's as open as possible yeah. to what the technology is possible to do, you know, and I even hear some stuff sometimes about, you know, AI that kind of blows my mind. I mean, you know, as I've, I've told you before, we don't use AI to write music, but I know a lot of companies do. Um, I think music's better being 100% human grade. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who think that there's, there's space in this world for, for auto-generated music. Um, so sometimes I come across ideas that I'm less keen on just personally, yes. but I but they don't surprise me, you know, because I think there are, you know, people are const constantly innovating. Yes. So I think, you know, I think we'll see a lot of exciting things. I think, at least for my audience, because for the most part, I have a lot of people in my chat even now, surprisingly. Um, you guys aren't working right now. Why are you here? But <laughs> <laughs> with, with, I, bet, with, I bet they're all from Singapore. It's like 11 p.m. here. So they're <laughs> just, they're all wait. They're going to go to bed soon, probably. That is right. You are in Singapore. You're from the UK and then you moved to Singapore. So you're a whole 12 hours ahead of us. Oh, wow. Yep, I am. Yeah, bang on 11 p.m. Oh, wow. So with us being creators and the thing you said earlier about being aware of AI, like I'm aware of the AI and predictive linguistics and how that can change. Uh, um, his system is probably more financially profound in the, mm -hmm. in the financial sector. I think that's where he yeah. makes his living. But in the music sector, um, I'm one of those people who do reverse engineering of audio manually. And it takes time. Uh -huh. It takes inspiration. You got to feel like doing it. And, you know, real life has to line up with you for you to be productive. Whereas yeah. if AI does it just by giving it a few queries or, or giving it a framework to work in. And I know people are working on that to recreate jazz music. I know a whole bunch of different things that are happening. Do you think if we're nudging all of us, everyone working in tech, everyone working in teaching, everyone talking about AI in the future, do you think we're actually going to get... Do you think humans will adapt to that? Like, will, will we get a, a type of human that can make music better than what the AI is thinking about or been taught to do? Do you think that's actually going to be the the unexpected foreseen effect? Like, oh, kids don't want to listen to iPods no more. They're going outside and they're playing these new instruments. Right. Um, good. Yeah, good question. I think, personally, my opinion is that at the minute, I've a lot of people have played me music created by AI. Uh, Google even had a project where they did a bunch of AI generated piano music. Um, not specifically talking about Google's piano music, but at the minute when someone plays me some music generated by an AI, or they play me a bunch of music and ask me to guess like which is AI, which isn't, I currently can't tell the difference between AI and just something that's not great. You know, there's okay. a there's a lack of there's I feel like there's a lack of context. There's a lack of like space. There's a lack of um, like breathing within the music itself that 
that to me just sounds like it's someone who maybe is inexperienced and just rushing through it or just someone who's all about the notes and or the speed you know i if it, so which which aren't characteristics i associate with great musicians so at the minute i feel like i can't quite tell but we're probably not that far off something that's so good that when i hear it i'm blown away wow. you know whether whether then when i hear it and then someone says, oh, you know, that was AI, whether I then go, oh, I'm so impressed and I want to hear more or whether I just go, oh, that's kind of a fun trick, but I'm whatever, you know, it's like, I think because I think music is more emotive than, you know, than, than the AI often can understand, but also as well, back to, you know, back to what we do, you know, if there's already 30,000 songs coming out a day, there's already so many people who want to make music, who are making music, who are releasing music. You know, it's not like there's a lack. It's not like it's everyone sitting here going, if we don't get this AI writing music, we're going to we're going to run out. You know, it's F, people who love playing music and love writing music are still doing it and it, they'll keep doing it, whether AI is doing it or not. So I don't I don't quite see the pull you know, the desire for the for the AI generated music um, that I see compared to say how much more important it is to just be able to curate the music that already exists and use AI to power that function. I just hope there's not any, you know, evil scientists out there because the one scenario that I often think about, I think about it causing a, a, a chasm or split where it's like, you have all these independent creative people who already exist. I mean, we're on YouTube, mm -hmm. we're on SoundCloud, we're on the internet in someone's Facebook DMs. We're already there, yeah. right? But my concern with AI being good is that then if you're in the sync business and you have AI that's good enough to analyze good sync music, and then you have another mm -hmm. AI that's good enough to recreate sync music, you kind of yeah. cut off the licensing and the human part because our whole industry, even India, like it's about cheaper labor it's about more effective and more importantly more than any of that it's about time so it's like yeah. hey we have this you know netflix are doing originals almost every week now it's like hey we need to score 20 episodes and we want to do it based on braveheart and we want to do it based on this this kung fu movie and tell the yeah. ai to do it and you know you hit render and it's like why mm. why call the guy in los angeles so right now i know it's not there but mm. these kids are just working on it they're studying Miles Davis and stuff and trying to get it there. So I guess, yeah. is there anything, is there any thresholds in place that are shared by the tech community that goes, we're not going to push that button? Well, you know, I, I spoke to someone recently uh, about this and I, I wish I could remember who, who, who it was so I could credit them. But, you know, their theory was that that may well exist. Someone may well come up with something that can write music that's great for sync, cheaper, faster, and and yeah, good for them. But there there will then become a value in something that is human curated, like human written music will become like a premium product. Okay, so like you can get like your knockoff cereal, but if you want your fancy brand cereal that comes in a box, not a bag, you got to pay extra. And, you know, because yes. people still want, so they'll almost be like a red stamp. You know, it's like 100% human created non -GMO music. Non-GMO music. Yeah, yeah, non-GMO music. This is all, this is all original, 100% human music, you know. And, and yeah, I wish I could uh, quote, quote the person who, who told me that because I thought I could see that. I can see that music written by humans will become the premium product. And that doesn't mean there's there's no space for the free stuff, you know, especially if it if it comes to like, I don't know, even student film stuff or yeah. advertising and and maybe a little bit of sync. But I think, you know, you know, brands these days and advertising and even TV like Netflix, it's all about authenticity. OK. And so brands and companies that then want to be a part of that, that can tell a bigger story with music, like, for example, not quite the same but you know we we just got a new a new office space here in singapore and we we were like i was like let's get some artwork for the walls now you know it's not that hard to like find a couple of prints that you like that someone's knocked up that are printed out all over the place and you know that that's all or, or just knock something up in photoshop and or just print out your logo real big get it printed up but what i did was i went to some local artists 
and we had you know we we asked them we gave them a brief we want some custom artwork for the walls we want to work with local artists we want to work with local singaporean guys local singaporean girls we want to pay you a fair wage and we want some great custom artwork and is it the cheapest or the easiest way to go no but is it what we represent as a company and what we want to look at day in day out you know i think authenticity and art artistry you know whether it's artwork or music yeah. um I think I think people just feel such a human connection to that that I that I don't it's it's never it's never going to disappear. If anything, I think it'll become it'll become a premium product. I I agree with you. I think uh, what's it what it, what it may do though. There's this uh, theory called the pirate's dilemma, or it creates this bell curve of talent. And that's why I was asking you about. Do you think the kids will become like mutants who play different instruments or play even more complicated music because the if the AI detection algorithms can recreate anything, and then there's an, there's the systems like you guys are developing, and you can raise the floor of what AI can do, like the quality mm -hmm. of music. Like like there's a website out here called a uh, Taxi, and you know it takes amateurs. We submit tracks, and Taxi goes, we need it. Your AI already is going to help them because it's going to sort through all these amateur tracks, find a diamond mm -hmm. in the rough, and secure mm -hmm. the sink. But the evil scientist guy who doesn't care about any of that. He goes, well, Taxi, what are you looking for? What are we talking about? I got it. So what that'll right. do is all the amateurs on Taxi have to get better than the AI. I guess that's mm. what I'm looking at. The, the floor. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure this is very reminiscent of an episode of Star Trek Voyager. Uh, have you? Do, I don't know if you're a Voyager fan. <laughs> As a kid. The doctor, yeah, where the doctor who likes to sing... Um, you know, they ch he flies down to a planet. Um, they like his singing, but then they figure, well, he's he's a he's a, a hologram, right? So he could be programmed to sing any note. And he then then they program him to sing something that no human could ever sing. And to to him, it loses the it loses the passion. But to the aliens who've never heard music before, they're like, it's the most difficult thing possible. This is definitely a this is very sci-fi now. I like this. Um, so I. Do I think that might happen? Yeah, but I, maybe not exactly like that, but will the game change somehow so that humans find their value in other ways? Yes. Absolutely. Is it changing the instrument or the music? You know, maybe not. Like, I think, you know, famously the violin was perfected, you know, almost immediately and hasn't changed in the last however many however many years. So, and, and you know, guitars often don't change that much it's still your strings and your neck and all that kind of stuff so maybe maybe the instruments won't change but the the market will change and what becomes valuable will right. change and it might it might be something you know about you know if we think about you know when i think about the early days of the internet you know when i joined um social early social media sites it was all about making up a user handle like uploading uh one image of yourself and now it's all about use your real name use your real face you know be be your authentic <laughs> self because your you as an individual has value and you know i think that there are there are multiple different ways the industry could go um and i and i think we'll start to see that value becomes attached not just purely to the song itself but to the whole experience yes. i think I, I think what you're, what you're describing is that the market, so so we're in an odd place where music almost feels worthless in America because last year mm -hmm. they released so much at us and they just like mm -hmm. before the end of the year, we had like all of our famous artists released a project and there's no way that you had time to consume it. So mm -hmm. the perceived value seemingly dropped. We have our American record labels trying to sell to digital distribution companies or Google for all, all intents and purposes. And mm -hmm. it reminded me of, we had a market crash with the housing crisis where they like uh, bought all the houses, flipped all the houses, inflated everything with loans. And then when it hit rock bottom, everyone sold. So it kind of feels like right. they're selling our music because our, or I can only speak for the Western hemisphere. We didn't react to piracy fast enough or we didn't mm -hmm. react to the demand for digital platforms fast enough. So mm -hmm. now the value, there's no CD, there's no record, there's no physical intrinsic value to music. Now it's free streaming. Now it's all these things. Now it's curated. Now AI is trying to make mood music. And I feel like what you're talking about and what I'm worried about, what the demand would then be, how do we create a platform for music that becomes valuable again? 
And I guess that's what I'm mm-hmm. looking. That's what I'm like trying to do the words connect on. Like, well, where would the value come from? Because if it's already valueless mm-hmm. and it's cheap, then they want it cheap to make because it's cheap. And then you get the cheap AI to make the cheap stuff. And we got loop libraries and everything already. So yeah, where's the where's that uh, lining the silver lining in the clouds where it's like ah, boom. Like, is yeah. there a potential for and, us to turn it around? Yeah. And it, and I think there is. And I think that's because as well, you know, like the, the IFPI report just came out, you know, in 2017, the music industry globally, the recorded music industry, I'd say, in 2017 was worth 17.3 billion US dollars. And then the new report, which just came out this April, uh, has got the 2018 stats. The industry was worth 19, 19 billion US dollars. So we've seen like a $2 billion increase in one year. Wow. And it means that people are spending more money. But what you're seeing is that digi- uh, sorry, physical, like CDs and cassettes, that's shrinking all the time. And streaming's growing and it's filling that gap, but it's not filled it all the way back up. You know, we've still got another 30% of growth to go before we're even back where we were when, you know, CDs were, you know, uh, in their height. So I think the industry's, messed up a bunch of times they really missed the boat on digital downloads they really missed the boat on streaming we're kind of in a back in a little bit of an upward curve but one thing that always gives me hope that gives me that gives me praise on this is that you know some something someone said to me which is like music is recession proof you know music nobody nobody ever goes into you know when when the when the crisis hits and 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 the 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 house values drop no one goes well i'm going to stop listening to music because i can't be affording that this month i can't be affording listening you know what i mean like they they just no one ever gives up music that's not something that people cut out of their budget you know oh wow the what it what it costs and how it's accessed can change but it's not something that people ever go you know, not like, well, I got two pair of jeans, so I'm not going to get another pair. Yeah, you know, I got, I listened to two songs, I'm not going to listen to a third. That it doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way with music. People still want music; they always want music in their life. You know, it's, it's very hard to meet someone ever who's not interested in any kind of music or doesn't like any kind of music. So, you know, it's been described to me as a, as a bit of a recession-proof business. That doesn't mean that it's not hard that it's not hard to make music and it's not hard to navigate your way through a, a, a changing industry. Um, and especially in the, in the Western industry that has, you know, has struggled to, to keep up with the change and the pace of technology. Um, and actually this was, you know, something else, uh, you know, obviously the music industry works very differently in Asia, works very differently in China. Um, but even the monetization models that we see in Asia, you, you do see that people are willing to pay it's often a different way. Maybe it's a subscription. Maybe it's some sort of tokens, or like on Twitch, when people can, you know, um, subscribe. There are lots of different models, but people will pay for something that they're enjoying, that they'll like. So it's just about really maximizing those models. And are we completely finished in how the music industry looks? No. Will it look pretty different in five years? I think it'll look a little bit different. I think there'll be other things. I think there'll be other companies. But um, but it, I, I feel hopeful because I know we're back on the on the upside. On the upside plan. of it. Okay. So I, I like that. I, I, I like your optimism. That's contagious. So I, I feel much better. <laughs> I feel so much better. Good. <laughs> Good. And, and also, if it, if it makes you feel any better, these AIs that write music, they ain't going to get anywhere close to being uh, mistaken for human for a good five to ten years. So just start churning them out now. <laughs> make the money. Make the money now. Okay. I've, and that's what I've been telling everyone. I say, like, listen, guys, we have this We have this window. Uh, we can seize the moment now. Because, you know, when yeah. it's a thought in your head, you know, no matter how the outcome is, if it's a thought in your head, that's just a call to action for you to get, stay focused and do what you need to do now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, there's, a, there's another element of the industry. So this is somewhere in between what you and I have been talking about. How would you feel about uh, a tool that when you sat down in front of it and you uploaded the latest track you'd written, a tool that had so much data that it could say, uh, you know, if you add another verse and a chorus, you'll increase your you know, your chances of uh, a deal by 5%. If you switch this to an A minor, you'll get an extra 17,000 streams within 24 hours. Like, how would you feel about a tool like that? It's a, it's, it's a two-edged sword, right? 
Right, right. Because I do that with the with the little bit of tools that we have, you know, based on just mm-hmm. intuition and referencing with the human ear, right? Like a DJ. But uh, yeah. I personally would, would buy that tool 10 times. Um, mm. I don't know if I'd be able to sell it to anyone else because peop- there's the more I talk about these kind of subjects, the more pushback I get and the more confirmation I get that people want to keep music sacred. So that's a good mm-hmm. thing. That's mm-hmm. a powerful thing. But if if we pay for guitar lessons, if we pay for piano lessons, if we watch YouTube videos, if we pay for master classes from our favorite producers, then that tells me enough people also want to be good. So yeah. if the tool can help you get good and goes, hey, th- this this tonality is off, this tempo is off, these things, these minor things, usually arrangement is off, I think everyone would fall in love with it. And I think more so it might become a standard in our DAWs or creative mm-hmm. spaces than a, than a thought. I don't see that as a yeah. plug-in. I think that is kind of like, I know of another company who's allegedly working on just an arrangement tool where it can take uh, a song's pro- any song that you likes prototype and then mm-hmm. transpose it and then outline it and then you kind of take your blocks and ideas and fill in the blocks. Now it doesn't okay. impact the sound at all. It's just arrangement, mm-hmm. just structure. All right, so this okay. is an intro. This is eight bars. This is sixteen bars. This is four yeah. bars. So it's just one of those yeah. things. So you don't shoot in the dark with loops. But right. if there's a tool out there that goes, <laughs> silly mortals, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm buying it ten times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, I think a certain well-known streaming service is uh, is probably going to try and build it themselves. So um, so we'll we'll keep keep an eye out for that one. So <laughs> I already know what you're talking about. That's funny. So with <laughs> so with, so so with the so they're actually ch- they're so they're gonna curate the best playlist ever. And then as to balance out their karma, they're going to in, uh, provide a tool that allows you to increase your chances to be on the playlist. Yeah, and where does that stop? Maybe then everyone just produces the same song and it sounds exactly right. the same across the board. But actually, no, on a more serious note, you know, people work on this stuff from an R&D perspective. Yes. The companies that have become successful in the music tech space are because they've dedicated time and resources to, to research and development. Will this tool actually work or come to fruition? Maybe, maybe not. You know, there's, it's a bit like Google. For every, you know, great Google Drive product, there's like 10 things that just, you know, were born and died because no one used them or they were no, not good enough. Um, but the, the best companies think in terms of what if we try a bunch of different things? What if we experiment? What if we don't let ourselves be held back by with, you know, oh, no, we don't do we don't do that here or we don't think that's going to work or, you know, because those are the people that get caught out. Those are the sorry to say it, guys. Those are the blockbuster videos of the world, you know? <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> this one, this one, I guess, at least for the 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 niche or the corner of the market that I interact with, those kind of tools are probably the most interesting, most intriguing, and most taboo. And I think mm-hmm. because of that kind of energy that surrounds it, like the fear of the unknown, like if we open up this box, can we close it? Or if we open up this box, do I go from uh, wishing I can do this to actually being able to use it? Because even now, mm. we have stellar instruments and tools and virtual things, like you were saying with the DAWs and the apps. Yeah. But, but that has not actually, contrary to a lot of the pushback that I've read and seen, actually made the music from people get necessarily better. Mm-hmm. If anything, yeah. it's actually created a new type of challenge because one thing about human processing power is that mm-hmm. if you have too many options, you usually don't choose to do anything. Yeah. And it's a very yeah. strange thing. And uh, it is weird because you think with like with people who are rich or with money, it's like the more money they get, the more they build. But with yeah. musicians or creative people, it's like the more palettes or the more colors of blue they have, the less paintings they make. So yeah, yeah. So even that is like, hey, you're gonna throw all these things at us, and the same three people who would have made it without it are gonna make it with it I, I, in, yeah. in a weird kind of way. And and I agree. And you know, becoming good at those tools is almost learning an instrument of itself. You know, I can. I can drag and drop a bunch of loops into a, you know, on a on a DAW timeline, and it sounds terrible. Someone who's experienced, someone who's good at this, can make the same loop sound phenomenal. It becomes yeah. a skill in and of itself, and again, one that you have to practice. 
Um, but also as well, you know, maybe some of the skepticism around the uh, around the the tools that can that can help or that can change music. I think one of the things I think about it is like I'm pretty sure if I uploaded some of the music I'd written, I would just be told it was terrible. So I think maybe there's some fear for that as well. You know that um, that yeah, some some music's just. My music, maybe, is just not that great. So you say it's, it's, it's going to be like a, a college application process. Like, ah, uh, we looked at the SAT scores and we determined you might want to be a carpenter. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's more like ordering a, a sandwich at Subway. It's more like, you know, yeah, you got to choose from six breads. you got to choose. Oh, no, I give up. Too much choice. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an interesting counterbalance to, to, and I think it's a side effect of how we think, actually. I think that's, all of that is a product and side effect of human thought. And, I, and that's what makes AI compelling. And because that's Western thought, at least that I'm speaking from. But when you guys start to connect the music. So, so I have a theory. I have a theory mm -hmm. that there is a hit song formula for pop music, right? I'm certain it exists. And I know I have glimpses of it, right? I have pieces of the theory. Mm -hmm. I haven't made one yet. I haven't published one yet. But I... I'm sophisticated to understand what the, the common denominators are, right? I have yeah. the theory that if you do that for every culture or every style of music, that that ratio or that, that branch, that tree that connects them all is going to get so small mm. in that you'll be able to figure out the requirements regardless yeah. of the music. And yeah. I think that is the thing that's probably most valuable to the evil scientists that I'm thinking about. So, <laughs> <laughs> so once that plant or that tree or that seed is created, that's that's what, what I'm really concerned about because I kind of feel like we're all making the same song anyway. I kind of feel like like life is a song, like music is yeah. animating everything, and sort of how like they found the so-called god particle. I kind of feel like AI is looking for the god particle of music. Yeah. Of, or what makes a well, human react, smile, cry, you know, all those things. I think that's where this is actually going. And and I would say, you know, the the theoretical uh, mad scientist that's out there, the, the good thing about working in the music industry is that most of these evil scientists are focused on the finance and the medical industry. Um, uh, they usually do, they they usually leave us alone. So uh, we can we can to sit over here and do our creativity. Shh, they don't realize how valuable uh, our, our industry is. So we'll just let them keep working on the uh, working on the uh, the hedge funds and all that kind of stuff. That that works for me. But um, yeah, I mean, I can. But then I can kind of see just to to take it philosophically. I, I, I would say it's probably true in my experience of, say, India or China or Southeast Asia, the different languages and the different music. I still think you can distill a formula. It's a different formula, you know, for what makes a successful K-pop song, for what makes a successful Western pop song. But it, there's probably still a formula in there. And does it sort of philosophically then, as you say, come to such a fine point that everything is almost unified but then where does it go next yeah like you know then do people just start making the most insane sounding stuff because it's the opposite or because it's different you know like because the human brain gets a, a certain amount of joy from novelty you know there's i i don't oh, wow. even know where it would go after that i don't even know but it's it's interesting to think about wow so what are your guys? So, because <laughs> my brain, I just, I did it fifty years in the future. I think, I think, yeah, I'm, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm going to become the mad scientist. But before I do, before I change the coin of that, with, with this company, where are you guys going, or what are you guys hoping to accomplish in the immediate future in terms of what Musio does? And tell us a little bit about that, and what some of the hurdles or challenges you guys have, and what are some of the potential outcomes you guys are hoping for from it. Mm -hmm. So, so what we're really focused on at the minute is, you know, there isn't, uh, to the best of our knowledge, another company out there that's like us, that's using the audio file in the unique way that we are, you know, we're using a very advanced form of AI that, you know, I'm very lucky my co-founder is, you know, one of the best AI developers in the world. Um, and at the minute, unless you got a guy like this, you don't have access to this kind of technology. So, you know, it's really, we're, we're exclusively using our combination of my experience in the industry, his expertise to bring a product to 
many companies. You know, it's theoretically possible that, you know, one of the big guys, one of the, you know, the, the big four, the big five could build something like this themselves if they resourced it and they put a lot of money behind it, but then they would only use it for themselves. And then there's no, you know, the only their service benefits, you know, really what we want to do is make sure that if everyone has access to this service for, you know, an, an affordable price, then every streaming service is now, you know, if they've got 20 million tracks and they're only playing 2 million of them and those other 18 million are just sitting there, well, now you can start curating those other 18 million. Now you can start bringing variety to playlists. Now you can start giving opportunity to artists that were sitting in that database not doing anything, you know. Same when it comes to, to sync music, you know. If there's more, more and more music in these sync catalogs, a, a sync catalog can have, you know, 100,000, 500,000, a million tracks. Um, I can't remember a million tracks all in my head. So if someone asks me for something in a catalog, I'm going to just pull from what I know. I'm going to keep pulling maybe the same stuff. If I, if I use a keyword to search it, you know, the, the words we use to search music, the language hasn't changed, right. but the volume of music has changed. So the ability just to surface better content and to be able to apply that to multiple parts of the industry, you know, we want to benefit the user's experience, but we want to benefit the artists whose music is on these platforms as well, currently potentially undiscovered. That's amazing. So you might end up opening a portal or a door where there might be a kid who uploaded like his favorite guitar stuff. Like he made a stellar project, you know, everyone at the coffee shop loved it, but with yeah. this kind of tool to sort and sift it, he might find himself into brand or uh, opportunities with his music that he didn't necessarily have to copy and paste his link all over social media to find. Exactly, because there's definitely a skew at the minute with the artists that are getting the most traction and being the most successful are the ones who are great marketers. And, you yes. know, I'm, I'm a marketer myself. I, I can respect that. But there's a lot of talented people out there who aren't necessarily, you know, super hot in their social game. So how do we give them opportunities? How do we how do we detach a lot of the other stuff that isn't necessarily about the music to be able to just find the great music and to give a different type of people an opportunity you know i don't even think all of the markets are fully online you know spotify might have 30,000 songs a day uploaded but i don't think everyone in indonesia philippines india who has the potential to make music is currently making music i think we're going to see that number grow massively over the next five to ten years i Me think too. you know we're only seeing the the very tip of the iceberg in terms of content curation because i think people want to create I think more and more people want to create. And so then it's going to become more of a, a challenge. Well, now now it's an open playing field. Now everyone can create. How do we just make the experience better? How do we find the talent? Wow. I think uh, I I had I talked about this uh, uh, maybe a year and a half ago. I remember talking about how uh, even in the West Western world of like Twitter, Facebook and everything, we're not even really connected to China. So, mm. so I noticed like there's a lot of people who retweet K-pop songs, I think from a group called BTS and I know nothing uh -huh. about them, but I know there's a Western propaganda, social media, social engineering campaign for them in our, right. in our timelines. Right. And I noticed the memes and the jokes. I'm like, why do these yeah. seemingly American people get the humor in this thing that we don't have any exposure to? And it's at such uh -huh. a, a, it's not huge scale yet, but it's big enough for me to raise my eyebrow every time I see it. Mm. Then I go, but if BTS is doing that here, what happens when they really open the floodgates and we find out all the other talent that's there? Because, you know, a lot of Americans watch anime now. So we're getting yeah. we're getting yeah. conditioned to listen to the intro songs and things. And maybe all you're on the, maybe you're on this scale. You're on the scale of like what the U.S. is comfortable listening to. And then you got. The, the real, you know, uh, K-pop and Chinese music. And then you got BTS, which is somewhere along the comfort scale, right? This is the, this is the, the you know, welcome to, welcome to uh, Eastern music kind of pop. It's, um, so yeah, maybe because there's a benefit, you know, if they can only ever sell, if BTS can only sell to their local market, you know, there's a cap on their success. If they can become global by finding global appeal, that's a, that's a good opportunity for those kind of mega star artists so you know i think uh yeah and i i think yeah you're right to notice it because i think you'll probably start seeing a lot more of it wow so 
you, you think they'll end up being a Spotify China that Americans subscribe to separately? Hmm. So the Spotify China is called Tencent Music. Um, and they are the most profitable streaming service in the world. Um, so not not necessarily here to to, to just uh, spruik them, but they Tencent Music have 800 million active daily users, and Spotify have only 90 million paid subscribers. So I mean, when you're talking about China, you're talking about scale, and they have scale, and they are the market leader, and they are. Yeah, they are the ones to watch. So how how does that market? So I I guess so. So for China, does China or the bigger markets or the successful markets are the Western companies competing for market share, or are they competing to just dominate the market they're in? So like for instance, is it would it be smart for people to want to say, hey, I want to compete with Ten Cent, but we can't because we don't have mm-hmm. the people or reach or language, or is mm-hmm. it a thing where they're going to have like a universal? streaming service that unites them so that when your algorithm works and they find this god particle of music then everyone in the world can uh, potentially be on the same network so it's six yeah. billion or five billion people on a platform versus it being you know right now it seems yeah. to be zoned i d- i don't know i'm i'm not sure where it'll go from the zoned model i'm trying to think of other sort of big corporations and, you know, like even something like oil and gas or, or, you know, something a bit more traditional because they do things differently and they sell things differently. And a lot of their appeal is that localization. Got is it. that, you know, the Tencent music, it links in with all of your other services that you're using locally, you know, all of your other apps. You know, Spotify appeals very much to the Western market because they have all the Western content. They've got great curation. Um, but again, you know, local services in India do very well because they have local music, Thailand, Vietnam. So there seems to be some, uh, there seems to be a high level of localization. And yes. that that is something that's incredibly popular in this part of the world. And I don't see that changing, but you'll often see like in India, Spotify just launched in India. Yeah. And so now you're seeing a Western player going for a different market that they've not gone for before. But you know, that only happened just earlier this year. So I think what we're seeing is how that's gonna play out. I think um, the, the nudging that you mentioned earlier about the guy who was talking about the scale of mm-hmm. traditional and it's getting closer to the Western or the universal format, I think mm-hmm. that would have to manifest before the light bulb goes off. Yeah. And and I think you know we'll you know we'll we'll uh, I keep a close eye on all these happenings. I like to know what's going on. We'll see what happens, but I feel like we're we're right at the beginning of that story okay. in terms of what is what is the global landscape going to look like. Um yeah, I'm watching. It's interesting. <laughs> well, you're going to end up you're going to open up Pandora's box. <laughs> you, you get the you get to write it. You 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 yeah, write yeah. it. You're going to write it. Well, ho- hopefully, hopefully it's in good hands. That's the plan. Awesome. But anything else you want to share with us, or any other insights, or any encouragements for the creatives? Because we're all we're all music makers. Yeah. Well, I just keep keep making, keep creating. Uh, something I always say to artists when I when I talk about artificial intelligence is that you know the way I envisage AI is we're not looking to you know get rid of musicians. We're not looking to change creativity. All I know now is that currently if you upload your music to your SoundCloud or Spotify, you know, other than your direct audience, it's very hard to get playlisted. It's very hard to get found on these platforms. You know, I I can't guarantee that you'll get playlisted or put in a or put in a, you know, on someone else's front page. But, you know, it's now no longer manually possible to listen to all new music. But with AI, you have a better chance of being discovered. So to the creators keep going keep doing it (laughs) but i thank you for your time and your energy i thank you for uh talking us off the proverbial cliff (laughs) um i'm much happier knowing i have at least five years left 
And <laughs> uh, no, you got you. I, I said five to ten, so you know, hopefully ten. You got keep keep making that. Then make a big one, retire early. That's that's the plan. <laughs> that is the plan, and I'm gonna try to help as many people as I can in the meantime. But thank you, Miss Hazel from Musio, M-U-S-I-I-O dot com. You got it. Thank you so much for having me.